Well, that looks messed up. Um, how many of you uh, have seen one of Andrew's Sphinx talks at this conference? So a handful of you. So I did the I did a version of this talk on Tuesday without the messed up title slide, and it took about 50 minutes. I have about 20 25 minutes to do this, so I need to do it really quickly. Uh, so I'm going to omit a lot of detail and try to get more into the, the details of some of the search stuff I did. Um, you can stop anytime and ask questions, but I'll just try to plow through a bunch of stuff and then get to the good part. So my name is Jeremy Zawadny. I work at Craigslist, and I'm going to talk about uh, MySQL and Sphinx, which is what we're using for search. Um, this is stuff about me, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, that's Craigslist. How many of you don't know what Craigslist is? God, this is easy. Okay. Um, so we do classifieds, and they're mostly free, and a lot of people come to use Craigslist, so that's Craigslist. We also have forums where people can leave messages and uh, rant about things and say whatever they want to say. And uh, they find lots of uses for them. Um, so, <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things about being at Craigslist is we're, um, we've got a fairly high churn rate on the data coming into our database and the content we want to serve because classified ads are coming in all day long. and. The half-life of an ad can be very small. I mean, I, I'll post stuff in the free section, I only need to get rid of an old cat tree or something, and, and 10 minutes later, I've got 20 messages in my inbox, people want it, and so I go in and delete the ad, and, and that means the thing lived for, for 10 minutes. And other ads will live for days or weeks, uh, just depends on the, the thing someone's trying to sell or get rid of, or the service they're advertising, or whatever it is, and the city they're in, and all sorts of things. Um, but we. We've got that high churn rate, so data's coming in all the time. We want to make it available as fast as we reasonably can. We're also dealing with lots of growth. I mean, the site traffic has been going up steadily for years. The user base has been going up steadily for years, and, and so is everything else. Uh, we also have a lot of traffic volume, so any small changes we make get amplified pretty quickly. Um, we've had experiences, uh, probably all of us have, of making a change we thought was small and, and finding it had ripple effects that slowed things down. Um, we have uh, a lot of interesting needs in the back end, and, and tools for analysis and, and customer care tools and things like that that, that need to do interesting things with the data that aren't necessarily compatible with what we need to do to keep things fast. So that's a battle we fight all the time. And uh, again, growth. And um, we have this odd need that I'm not going to talk much about because I did this on Tuesday in a long time, but we, we also try to keep all the postings that were posted on Craigslist in an archive and kind of keep them forever. And we've got hundreds of millions of these things, and that becomes a problem in its own right. Um, internationalization and UTF-8 is something that we need to do more about uh, and will become more of a problem as we kind of grow around the world. Um, we're a very small team, so a lot of times the fires take priority and we don't have time to focus on the stuff we ought to be focusing on every day. And the infrastructure can tend to get a little creaky now and then. And uh, it's kind of all grown up organically over time, so the code base is, is interesting in places. Um, some places people are scared of. Um, and sometimes you just wander into things and don't realize what you're doing. Um, again, growth, things keep growing, rates keep going up. And we, we have a lack of abstractions in places, which means there's a lot of SQL embedded all over the code. Um, there's not a common object to get a particular data thing out. Sometimes you just write the query because everyone knows the schema because things are pretty simple. Um, the trouble is a few years from now, I think we're going to be paying the price for that. We probably already are. And we, we have a lack of documentation and sort of this institutional knowledge problem. You can be staring at something and going, why the heck is it configured this way? There's no documentation on it, or the documentation is wrong, and you kind of have to ask around. And, and you find out not one person knows. It's like three or four people have to put their heads together to rec you know, recall the situation in which that was decided. And it's, it makes for some interesting work. Um, so this is a really simplified view of one subset of our internals that I showed on Tuesday. Um, kind of like from the web browser point of view, what happens when a request comes in. Uh, it hits a load balance at the top. And, and this is kind of split, read, read on the left, right, on the right, and uh, I didn't draw in all the right pieces, but you can think of, of all the requests hitting a load balance, so it goes to this array of read proxies that run a custom Perl process, <coughs> kind of like Perlbal, if you know what that is, and have memcache there as well. So a lot of times the pages you'll hit are served right, right out of that cache, so your request never goes any deeper into your infrastructure. We serve a lot of content that way because it's fast and it's efficient. If something you're fetching is not in the cache or has been expired from the cache, um, it falls down to the web read array, which is a pretty standard Apache and Mod Perl install. Um, again, there's a number of those machines there. And 
depending what you're trying to fetch, you may have to then turn around to this object cache we have, which is another combination of Perl and, and memcache to, to pull that object out, usually a classified posting and some data about, about it to create that page. Um, or if you're going to run a search, it may have to turn around, hit, hit our search cluster, which is a, you know, a group of Sphinx boxes, and then run the query, get a list of, of document IDs effectively, and then turn around to that object cache, fetch the objects, and render the page for you. Um, and then there are cases where if things aren't in that object cache, it has to fall the way down to the database cluster, and we have a read cluster there, MySQL 5.0.xx, uh, where we'll actually fetch the data, populate the cache, and then things will go all the way back up to you. Make sense? All right. Um, one thing we're, we're good at, I think, is we've, we've got some vertical partitioning, so we've got different clusters for different tasks or different roles. Um, you know, our user database is completely separate from our classified database, is completely separate from our forms database, and, and other things we do. I didn't put them all up here. Um, within those clusters, we tend to separate subgroups of slaves off for various um, tasks as well. So there is a, well, usually one for writes, that's the master. And then on the read side, you've got, we've got different database handles we can acquire based on the sort of read we want to do. If it's a very fast read that's like, find me a record based on the primary key, there's a handle for using that. Um, if it's a longer read, there's a, there's a different handle you use if you're going to do a scan or, or you know get a group of records back. Um, and, and then if you're going to totally trash the database by doing a full table scan, there's yet another handle you'll use because that particular server might not be completely caught up in replication if people are hammering on it that way. So we're pretty good about it. We've, we've managed to, to get this working pretty well. Um, Oops, so that slide says what I just told you, and I think says a lot of obvious things about why this is good. Uh, horizontal partitioning um, is in the works. We've got a project called Hydra, because it's, this is sort of a multi-headed thing, um, where we'll have a client that has the ability to talk to one or more clusters to fetch data. Um, in the case where you don't know the primary key of the record you want to fetch, um, you may have to ask all clusters, or a slave in all the clusters, if if the data exists there or run some sort of fancy query to find all the matching records if you're looking at secondary indexes or something like that. Uh, so we have not deployed this sharding infrastructure yet. It's kind of a work in progress. And um, it's it will help a lot when we get there, but it's also going to be very painful to get there because a lot of internal tools need to be rewritten. And uh, that's, that's one big lesson is if you think you'll need to do this, it's I know there's two schools of thought. One is try to never do it, but if you think you'll have to, I think sooner, sooner is better because there's less reworking you have to do down the road. Um, you know, like I said, we need to retrofit a lot of code. We also, all of our stuff's in Perl, so we needed a, an async Perl client, which wasn't really uh, a, a popular one out there. I found one posted on Google Code um, that works. I had to work around a few bugs in it um, to give you a sense of um, what it was like, there's, you know, I don't know how many hundreds or a few thousand lines of code in there, and I think there's two comments in the entire code base. Um, <laughs> so I've done a lot of testing with it. Um, what about libdrizzle? Uh, libdrizzle is actually later on in my slides, but I have high hopes for libdrizzle because it's something that I suspect will be far more supported and tested than the client I'm currently playing with. Uh, I've abstracted a lot of that away behind the Hydra library that I wrote so that uh, I could probably swap it out with libdrizzle or something similar and not have to deal with it. Um, Anyway, there are other benefits here. We can probably we can size our DB boxes based on sort of cost and performance and power and all sorts of other things, and then just you know change the way we do the hashing and, and not have to deal with um, with um, uh, being forced into buying bigger and bigger boxes. The other nice thing is since all of our data eventually expires and moves into an archive, we have the benefit that we don't have to uh, reshard data. Uh, as long as we stay far enough ahead of the curve, we can say, well, that cluster is just going to stop taking writes after a while. And then after you know, a certain number of days, we know everything on there will be expired. We can just effectively archive the whole thing and turn it off. And we don't have to worry about sort of main, you know, maintaining data in two places while it's resharded and dealing with all those logistics. Uh, we'll be able to just move and, and kind of have those rolling upgrades that can happen. So um, the thing I want to talk more about is what we did with search. Um, at the time, you know, the basic problem is people want to find stuff, and a lot of people in MySQL shop say, well, great, MySQL's got this full text search, let's use it. And it turns out to work really well, to a point. And, um, you know, some time goes on, things get bigger, and eventually, hey, this stuff doesn't scale so well, what do you do? Um, well, you can do a lot of partitioning games with the search and all sorts of things, and that's kind of what happened at Craigslist. Um, 
this is kind of the first big project I worked on, and I heard a lot of good things about Sphinx, which is a great open source full text um, search uh, search system. And um, I was like, well, I'll, we'll use Sphinx. That'll work out great. And then I ran into the problem that in my testing, Sphinx didn't actually scale the way I thought it was going to, and had to go and patch it. Um, if, if I don't make it to the end, I'll tell you the good news is that all the stuff I had to do to patch it is now in the current release of Sphinx, so you don't have to worry about this. But uh, we, we had to bang against it and get some bugs fixed in order to deploy it. So the problems we had, uh, we were sort of hitting invisible limits in the sense that um, the search clusters in the MySQL full text world were uh, performance would degrade or queries would back up. Um, CPUs weren't completely busy, memory was available, and the disks were not hitting IO bottleneck. So what the heck's going on? Some sort of contention inside the server. Full text is based on my ISAM, so there's not much you can do to move to another storage engine and still keep full text around. Um, so event, and, and since it's my ISAM, there is the occasional sort of crashing corruption of the tables as well. So um, there were five clusters of five machines, so that's 25 machines to serve all of search at the time. Um, this was last summer. And uh, there, were, there was some hand balancing that went on behind the scenes to try to keep the load balanced among those clusters, and, and that could be maintenance intensive. And I think the query rate then was something in the order of 30 million queries per day. And it, was, it didn't take much of a blip in traffic for, for one cluster to overheat or something like that. And uh, it got pretty painful. So uh, Sphinx was my first big project, like I said. It's a very fast and lean uh, system built with very good C++ code. Uh, it, it has a forking model, scales really well in multi-core boxes, which I like. I, you know, there's no locking and weird stuff like that going on. You get pretty good control over the indexing and um, stop words and character sets and all that kind of stuff you'd expect to have. Um, I spent a little bit of time looking at the uh, Apache Solar project, but didn't end up going down that road. I, I think it's also a great system. I did play with it a little bit. Um, so the implementation details, how did we do it? Uh, luckily, Craigslist is based on uh, local cities. You know, it's all about searching where you live or in the area you happen to be in. So I was able to partition things and have uh, per city indexes, which worked out very well. Because you know, we've got something like 500 cities, so I was able to build 500 separate indexes per city. And um, had to go through and kind of make decisions about what was going to be an attribute in the index versus uh, a keyword <coughs> full text type field. A lot of that was influenced by the work we'd already done with uh, MySQL full text. So it was a pretty easy, uh, pretty easy change to make. Uh, I had to implement uh, persistent connections in Sphinx. Uh, Sphinx at the time did not have that support in the server, so I had to modify the server as well as the Pro client library we were using. I was able to trim back our stop word list. We were using some combination of the original MySQL full text stop word list and then a whole bunch of other terms that looked like they'd been added over the years as you know, queries got slow, hey, well, let's add this word to the stop list or something to that effect. So we went from having this very large list to something like a dozen, a dozen terms, which means users can now find things they're looking for um, even when they enter something that was previously a stop word. I uh, partitioned the infrastructure into two clusters. Each cluster has a master and four slaves. Think about MySQL replication, it's the same kind of thing. You've got a master, four slaves. Um, all the indexing work happens on the master and the slaves replicate indexes from the master. The slaves handle all the live queries. So in the new world, yes? How do you do the replication? You just copy the files? The simplified version is to say, yeah, we use I IR sync from the, I IR sync the new indexes from the master onto the slaves. I can talk about that in more detail if there's time, which I kind of doubt. Um, so the issue is the big issue was we had to do incremental indexing because uh, we couldn't just re-index everything every like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever interval we wanted to use. That would take too long. And if we wanted to re-index the entire site every 15 minutes, it would take 37 minutes to do. Uh, that clearly wasn't going to work. Um, Sphinx has this, this notion in the documentation of a main plus delta strategy because you can query multiple indexes in Sphinx, and the order in which you query them is important because Sphinx will always prefer the document found in the most recent index. So that means I could have, um, I could have a system where I query multiple indexes and time effectively could decide in which index a document was going to reside. And I'll show you a quick diagram of this, but I implemented this as having a, a large index, an index of the stuff from today, and then a small delta index, which is things in the current update cycle as the uh, index updates fire off. So one set of these per city, so it's basically three things times 500, so you're looking at about 1,500 indexes total. Um, we need lots of file descriptors in order to do that, so I had to make sure limits were set appropriately. Uh, I use all four cores to index, so I have some custom indexing code. 
um, that basically forks off copies and does the indexing as fast as it can on a four-core machine. And then every night I perform this sort of big merge where I take the stuff in the, that's been accumulating throughout the day and merge it into the larger index for each city. And uh, I'll also generate all the config files via Perl too, so that's all, all automated. Um, I made several versions of a diagram to try to illustrate this, and this is, this is the, the one I'm using. Um, the delta index on the left is never actually queried. The two on the right, the today index and the actual index, as it's called, um, those are the two that are queried for any given city. So that number one could be 15 or 80 or whatever the actual number to represent that city is. And uh, we query both of them. So every, every X minutes when an index update fires off, we pull the changes from the database, all the new postings, all the deleted postings, all the changed postings, build an index called delta, and then merge that in with the today index. And we do that for all 500-ish cities, and those changes get moved out to the slaves through rsync. And then the slaves just have to do a quick restart to pick up the new data. And then once a night, I do the same thing, basically take all the stuff that's been accumulating in today and merge that into the main index. And the cycle just keeps repeating. Uh, there were some issues along the way. There were some bugs with this merge code when I talk about merging indexes. Um, it's a good feature, but I don't think it had been widely used because a lot of people use a version of Sphinx, which is actually a storage engine inside of MySQL. We're using a standalone daemon instead. Uh, I mentioned files. Oh, there was a file descriptor corruption bug that took a little bit of time to track down. That's been fixed. Persistent connections are also in mainline code now, but we had to, had to modify that. Um, there are a couple of interesting bugs that I'm not convinced are the Sphinx code or my code, but they're issues we're seeing with occasionally missing attribute updates, uh, and occasionally getting bogus document IDs back in responses. So I talked to Andrew a bit about this. I think if the protocol had a checksum in it, that would help. We see the same thing in MySQL replication. You know, having a checksum in the protocol makes a difference. Um, but Andrew and team have been great to work with. Um, and like I said, anytime I found a bug and build a test case, it was fixed pretty quickly. So what were the results of this migration? Well, we went from 25 boxes running MySQL full text close to the limits um, last year to basically 10 boxes, only eight of which are actually serving uh, queries at any given time. And we've got a ton more headroom, so much so that we were able to build new features. So we launched something I called Nearby Search um, uh, a month or so ago, where if you, if you run a search and it returns too few results, we'll, we'll run that search in a larger geographic area and give you more results. Uh, we couldn't have done that in the old system. It, it, there wasn't enough capacity there. Um, there's no weird seizing or locking issues or any of that stuff we saw with the, the MySQL version. Um, we're doing uh, over 1,000 queries per second in, in aggregate across the Sinks clusters during our peak times. And, you know, the CPUs are not pegged at all. Uh, we've got a lot of room to grow there. Uh, we're doing in the neighborhood of 50 million queries a day that make it to the back end and Sphinx has to process. Um, that I've, I've done some, I built in some sort of cluster partitioning so that all indexes don't have to live on all the back end servers. You know, thinking I need to scale it that way in the future. That's built, but don't even need to use it. Uh, all the servers are, are equal in this scheme. Uh, it actually gave us some, in some ways some better separation of, of, of code and data or some, remove some duplication because Sphinx does not have to hold on to copies of all the postings. It just turns us all, indexes all the data and doesn't keep around copies of the, you know, the posting titles and the bodies and all those sorts of things. Uh, there are some things on my wish list. Uh, one of these is already in the bug. Uh, I wanted efficient delete handling. Well, there's a feature in the new version of Sphinx called kill lists that's actually gonna make this much, much more efficient. And what that means is that big arc sync to pull the indexes down from the uh, master, or from the slave the slave pulls the indexes from the master, it'll be pulling about 10% about of the data it used to pull once I upgrade and get the, the kill lists in, in place. I'd love to have an index dump tool to get a bunch of data about the, the indexes. Um, the, the tools today are, are pretty primitive. Um, live document edition changes and deletes. Um, if you went to the Sphinx booth at the, in the .org pavilion, you may have actually seen this uh, being demoed. Andrew's been working on that. Uh, Built-in replication would be kind of cool if I didn't have to do my own rsync thing, but I built it so it works, uh, but still. Some internal stats and counters would be great. I'd like to keep track of queries per index and average times and min-max times and all sorts of things like that. Some of that you can get from the query log, but I'd like to be able to just ask the server for that information now and then or, or have it log some more detailed stats for me. Just like in MySQL, I can do show blah and it'll show me a bunch of stuff. I'd like Sphinx to have the same kind of thing. And I mentioned the, the checksum and the protocol as well would be great. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna stop right now and ask if anyone has questions in the back. Well, um, 
Sure. Uh, right now, uh, we've not done any relevance tuning. Um, in fact, we, we kind of take the easy way out and always return things in date order, most recent at the top, least recent at the bottom, because that's how it was on Craigslist. Um, now that we have Sphinx, we have the, uh, I think we have the capacity to do a lot more with changing how the results come back. Haven't done it, though. Yeah. Sphinx search engine versus standalone demon. Just a few seconds on why you made the decision to go for the standalone. Uh, I went with the standalone demon um, mainly because the idea of doing this all in a storage engine sort of philosophically bothered me, I guess. Um, I kind of like the idea of having something completely separate from the database that we could treat as a separate service, tune separately, scale separately. Uh, if this was something else we bolted into MySQL, it might have aggravated other problems that we were having with MySQL. So to me, it was easier just to treat this as a completely separate service and run Sphinx with a demon. Yeah, in the end, not, in my, in, well, I had to write a bunch of code anyway, so that wasn't so much of an issue. Way in the back. Uh, you built your uh, index off your master, is that correct? And why did you do that? Um, there's a, I guess there's a terminology um, thing here I didn't make clear. We have, we have master Sphinx servers in each cluster that pull data from our MySQL slaves to build the indexes. So in the Sphinx sense, those are masters, and the other Sphinx servers will copy indexes from them so they can serve live queries. We don't actually query the MySQL master database to get that data to index. Uh, we, we pull that from one of the, the up-to-date slaves. Yeah? When you don't send us queries, it's directly to your Sphinx masters, right? That's right. The Sphinx masters do not get queries directly. In fact, the Sphinx daemon is typically not even running on the masters um, because a lot of the index processing is done by command line tools that are scripted together. Um, they only fire up to handle some small uh, attribute changes. Yes? How are you monitoring your application process, making sure uh, your everything is copied over and the So how do I monitor this? Um, it would take a little while to explain how the whole like, how the whole rsync process happens without taking the servers offline too long. Um, if, you, if you know how like file system snapshots, or, like our snapshot work, I do an index versioning scheme where when, before I indexes, when they're created, I, I kick a snapshot of the existing indexes first, and then rsync to that new snapshot, so I'm only get it picking up the differences. So I kind of have versioned indexes on disk. Along with that versioned index that I pulled down from the master comes a timestamp and a heartbeat timestamp. And so what I can do is I can monitor those timestamps through our monitoring tools on all the servers individually and make sure they're, they're never um, greater than a certain distance from the current time. And that's kind of how we do it. Not using the Sphinx partitioning at all. I thought about it, but um, after I did some testing and kind of saw how, how efficient it was, I just didn't want that extra layer of complexity. But but that's something that may come into play, you know, six months or a year down the road if, if we end up doing something different with other features or, or changing the architecture a little bit. What's a full re-index cost you? How long? A full re-index of all content, all live content on the site. Like if I change the, the index schema, for example, it's about a six-hour process. Um, so that's one thing to consider, too, is I actually have, I have a way to back up our indexes a couple times a day in case something catastrophic happens. We don't want to be sort of six hours waiting to, to rebuild the search indexes. Any other One last question. How big is the table running? Oh, uh, total, like the size of the indexes? Yeah. Well, there's the well. The only tables involved are the tables that live in MySQL. That had, I mean, Sphinx pulls data from those. The indexes on disk, by the end of the day, end up being in the neighborhood of 20 gigabytes on each of the Sphinx nodes. Um, they all have 32 gigs of RAM, though, so in effect, the indexes all fit in memory. All right. How many documents are in the Sphinx? How many documents are in the indexes? Uh, a few tens of millions. I, I don't know an exact count. I have to go look. I looked at Apache Solar, but only while only at one point where I was sort of desperate and I hit a few bugs and didn't know if they'd be easy to fix and looked at an alternative. I think Solar would we could have made it work, um, but it, it's I could talk offline about why I wouldn't want to go that route necessarily as my first choice. Okay, thanks.